public in information. Um, but he doesn't have access to this set satellite data, and depending on their reporting systems, he may not get sales data for a week, a month, whatever it is. So then I take more of a position, and then the quarter comes out, they blow the quarter, and I get killed. So those are the kind of things that So I these alternative data s sources, and there's a lot of them, that's a great example, very visual, or out there. And Paul and I have been having this debate. It's going to there, change the world. That there are companies that charge money and they scrape the web. Every tweet gets analyzed. And they come up with sentiment, they come up with commentary, they come up with fads, they come up with trends and things like that. And if you're not aware of that, it's like not looking at the financials. The stuff, the information is as important as the financials. So if you're not aware it's there, and you're not having access to it, and it's not incorporated into your model, it's almost like I don't look at quarterly reports, I only look at annual reports. I only care what they do on an annual basis. That quarterly stuff, that it's literally the same. So Paul and I talked a lot about this. My first phenomenon is what we call, um, oh, I'm going to gamble with this. Um, paradox of skill. The only people left are very good. What he's talking about is that information <coughs> sources are being brought now and are very powerful. So it just gives you a flavor of what you have, you're up against. Yes. How much? How much influence do you think the current trading environment has when when one is trying to make a pitch? So to elaborate your question, for example, let's say uh, today the entire market is trading or the person's portfolio is trading at 20 to 25 times price to earning. There's a, there's a lot of um, high growth potential or or high value investments that this person may have made, or he's more of a growth oriented investor. And then let's say walk walk into it and generally the market is also trading pretty high. Now, there should I choose to make make a value investing pitch? Will that is that something that's easier to sell, or is it just easier to say that okay, look, you have already if made you want to that. get the job, yeah, you need to pitch a stock that fits the portfolio manager's scheme schema. Their criteria, their investment criteria. So if they're growthy criteria. oriented, yeah, you want to come in and do a growthy name. Uh, if they are more value oriented, Paul and I are keen on these two phrases because we think they, you'll see in the book, we don't talk about value investing anywhere, we don't talk about growth investing anywhere. <clears throat> we talk about what we call fundamental investing. Yeah. Fundamental, fundamental investing is, is that the value of the underlying asset is mispriced. We will tell you that between these alternative data sources and paradox of skill, that's hard to do. At the end of the day, you're pitching to a human being, you've got to pitch something that they think will fit. So I wouldn't go in, the market's very high, you've lost the interview. If you go in and say, I think the market's rich. If you, if you just read an interview on Barron's where he thinks it's rich, <coughs> or she thinks it's rich, and you want to say, I think it's rich, I'm, I brought you a more defensive name, well then you're showing the, an understanding of their criteria, you're going to impress them. Yeah, you're not going to get them to change their, their criteria. What my uncle told me very early on in my career is don't, if someone asks you for a red umbrella, don't bring them a blue one and try and explain how it's going to keep them dry. Just don't do it. So give them what they want. Just now that's, I think in an interview it's incredibly hard because guess what, you guys want jobs and we highly encourage you to go out there and get jobs. Uh, each interview is going to be slightly different criteria. So how do you have a pit? You, you have too much work to do. You have school. You have, some of you work part time. Some of you work full time and go to school part time. Some of you work full time and go to school full time. And there's a lot of challenges. And you like to have one pitch or two pitches you can kind of use. There's a lot of work to get this done. So this thought that you need one for every interview is almost impossible. But what you could do is demonstrate that you understand and say, hey, there's a pitch I've been working on. Why, right? I've been working on it for class, or I'm working on it for the club, or I'm working on it for a pitch. And although it doesn't fit your criteria, boy, right away, you've already distinguished yourself. I know that you guys tend to want things to grow faster, but this is what I really put together. And what I want to do is demonstrate to you that I understand how the process works. Exactly. Right? That capability that Paul So has. that will disarm them, because as soon as you say, I know that this doesn't fit your criteria, they are disarmed. And you showed that you've thought about their criteria. You know this idea doesn't work there. They recognize you're a student, you only have a certain amount of time, and say, this doesn't fit you, it wouldn't fit in your portfolio. But I do think it's a way that I can demonstrate the work I've done. I think instantly, as Paul says, disarms them, which is not a bad strategy, no matter even if it did fit their criteria, 
and you walked through the work you did. And they're now looking at going, wow, you did do some great work. You did do some impressive work. I like that. As opposed, it's almost a better strategy than saying, I found something that's going to fit your portfolio. Because they probably know it. Maybe they own it. Maybe they didn't own it. Maybe they just sold it. Right? You're now up against this sort of ego. Yeah, where being a little humble when you go in isn't a bad thing. And again, that kind of comes down to this subconscious stuff that's going on. So if you go in, and seen students do this all the time, you know, I've spent the last three weeks on this company, and I know it backwards and forwards. And, you know, they come in with an attitude, I know it better than you know. That's not a good strategy. So if you go in humble and you can say, you know, look, I've put a lot of time, I think I have a good understanding of it, but I clearly don't have the Or I was exactly what I was saying, or I was attracted to it because, you know, with Amazon dominating retail, you know, I think everybody's thrown the, the, the baby out with the bathwater. I think that, you know, uh, uh, the limited uh, has got kind of a, a, an angle here where they have a very loyal um, uh, customer base, and I don't think that this is going to be an online product. But again, thoughtful. You want to show them you've done thoughtful work. You say, look, the market thinks that this is a retail company. It's really a data company. That kind of language shows you that you're, you have a sense. Remember, you're just trying to show them your, cap your, your capability. You're just saying, I'm working on this. I think this is an interesting idea. And they may say, look, all due respect, you know, we used to be the largest shareholder. We sold it out. We're very worried about X, Y, and Z. Well, guess what? The next pitch, you now have a lot more information than you did. And you go in and say, look, I've been doing some work. I think it's interesting. But the big issue is here, right? It's okay to get that feedback. And if you can disarm the portfolio manager, that helps a lot. They were students once. Some of them are assholes. Look, I'm just going to tell you. You're going to run into some of them. That's a technical term. <laughs> they are. Dickheads, you're going to run. That's another. Thing. You're going to run into these people, and you're going to be like. And the the good news is the interview didn't go well. Thank God, because you do not want to work for them. You know, just to give you an idea, I've been doing this for a long time. If I pitch a stock, I qualify what I say, because I know that stuff goes wrong, and you get blindsided. And I know that uh, that there are circumstances like I don't want to walk into a buzz saw. So you have to be really so careful. So that's the difference. Is I go in and I just say, I know this cold. This is the answer. Another strategy. Yeah. Sorry, one follow-up question. So let's say if I look at a particular portfolio, and at least I believe while I'm doing my prep, I understand the criteria to a large extent. But then I find one stock which is, which is missing, which might, may have sort of outperformed most of them, which tends to that person, the portfolio manager's so-called regret list. Highly unlikely that I might be able to identify. You want to go with, with you want to go like down the middle of the fairway. Yeah, you know. But even yeah. that, even if it's a regret, you can go in and say, "Look, I was just looking at this thing, and this looks like the one that maybe the." that caught people the most by surprise. CEO executed way better than he ever did before. Before that, he was kind of a bumbling idiot. He read, you know, humble again, recognize you found one angle. The guy said, yeah, we missed that. Oh, yeah. Portfolio yeah. manager, yeah. most of them are very thoughtful people. And you're going to say, hey, I noticed you on this. He didn't, how come you didn't know this? And he's like, believe me, I kick myself every day. Um, but the but in terms of the nonverbal stuff, like no one wants to hear their kids are ugly. So, like to bring up an investment idea that didn't work out or that they missed, not a good strategy yeah. because they're going to have that comes in terms of the likability. They're going to associate you with a mistake that they made. Not a good thing. Can you talk about the other three parts of the book? <laughs> Very briefly. Briefly. Um, All right. Let me walk, I'll walk you through the way to think about the book. I'll give you the quick tour. One, two, three, and four are really about building up to intrinsic value. And one, we just stop. But how we start, and for a lot of you that have a strong finance background, that's going to be maybe the least interesting chapter. But it's the idea of how do you get the value of any asset. And I think the value add we have there is we've simplified the DCF. I know that, that this is the home of the DCF. And uh, if you don't believe in the DCF, you'll never graduate. Uh, and we respect that. Um, and look, Aswas forgot more about DCF than I've ever gonna know. And I, I think the guy's a fantastic professor. He's done, he's contributed as much as anybody to the understanding of it. But we said, 
you know, it's a simpler way to think about it. It's the, it, it's the timing of the cash flows, when you get the cash flows, how long you're going to get the cash flows, how big they are, and do they grow or not. And although DCF can get very complicated, if you start to think in those terms, it's just timing in the stock market is fairly easy because you just stop and say, well, assume annual payments. I mean, it's sort of simple. But. So it comes down to how big are they going to be, for how long, and are they growing? That's what a DCF is. All right, so then we then say, that's how you value an asset. We bring that out. Then we stop and we say, well, how would you value a business? Well, it's the same idea, but you have to understand where those cash flows come from. So you have to start to analyze the business. I'm going to skip three for a second, and then in the fourth chapter we talk about this notion of how you would then come up with intrinsic value. And the big there, big, the big reveal there is you have to think in ranges. It's not worth $18. It's worth 18 give or take. It's worth some range, and we do that. In, three in, in chapter three, we tackle two very important subjects, which is the duration of those cash flows, which is effectively competitive advantage. And we talk about growth, and I want to value it. And the stuff we did in growth, no one's ever done, and it's radically different than any DCF. Because the way you guys are taught is if I make a big investment, I charge the, the cash flow statement 100% in that first year. And that is logically incorrect. You should capitalize it, at least conceptually, and then have a charge against it on an annual basis. So we talk about how you want to think about growth, and those are two sides of the same thing. So that's the first part of the book. And once we get there, we think we have some very good tools that give a sense of intrinsic value. Now, everything you've learned about DCS and value and how many fits in perfectly. You can either replace it or add it to it. So that's the value. The next three chapters, we talk about how market prices are set. We introduce the notion of market efficiency. And humility aside, even though we said that, this is the first time I think anybody's written about market efficiency in a way that a practitioner can use it. And we start, we start with Fama's original paper in 71, and then really lean 65. on his paper in 90. No, 71. 70, 71. But the one that the Margaret Fisher just said was 71. And then 91. So which one I have a gentleman's best? 100. <laughs> right, we talk about that. And then the middle chapter, which is chapter, must be chapter 6. Yeah, chapter 6 is uh, Wisdom of the Crowd. So, and uh, Mobison's done some work on this. Or he's done some work. I've done some work. Paul's done some work on it. We really bring in a model on how you think about prices are set using some of the crowds. Then in the third one, we think about behavioral finance, which a lot of people will view as the alternative to market efficiency, and it's not. It's a subset of. So those, the first three for you, first four chapters, in some sense, are going to be most redundant from what you've seen. All of them argue chapter three is a new representation. I will then argue that chapters five, six, and seven, where we talk about prices set, are stuff you've never seen before. You'll see bits and parts. Of it. That's how we get to price and diet. We then talk about this notion of how to add value through research, which relates exactly to what we are the same structure, which is, guess what? You either have to find out information the market doesn't know, or you have to think about it. You have to analyze this differently. And we set that all up. Uh, and then the risk stuff is brand new. No one's ever seen that before, but there's visualization of risk and how you want to think about that, both in terms of intrinsic value and time. And that's the fundamental part of the book. That's what we the whole thing, book, and then we go into the picture, which we touched on today. I guess we could end it there. We could stay for more questions. Yeah, we we'll, we'll stay, but if, if people need to run off, we're, but we're happy to keep chatting. Yeah, we're, we're a safe environment, right? You can't go to portfolio manager ask these yeah. questions, but you can definitely ask us the questions. Because most likely, you'll never see us again. So if you really thought you were embarrassed, you'll never have to live with it. Um, and you know, we're out trying to educate the world, so. Feel free. Uh, we did bring a couple books. I have some more. Um, we're happy to sell some books if people want them. We think it's a really good book. Um, do keep in mind that every book we sell, he makes a dollar and a half, and I make a dollar and a half. So it really isn't about that. We have to sell a lot of books before it moves. Well, and we don't make a dime. We owe them like 25 grand or something. No, we don't. With the, yeah. What? With the urn. With the uh, No, no, no. no. It's not a big thing. Yeah, well, we'll be fine. I'll explain the math to you. Uh, so we're not really, I'm we not don't, that good, yeah. uh, a friend of mine published a book last year and he used to say, if you don't like the book, I'll give you the buck and a half back and then you can ask the publisher for the rest. So we're not, we did it because they, they just came out on Amazon. I ordered books months ago on Amazon. They arrived on Sunday. Uh, some other people close to me wrote, bought them and they arrived today and yesterday. So we've got some books if people want it. We know you have your pitches and in a short amount of time, and we think there's some stuff in that will help you kind of grow quickly up and distinguish yourself. So as a book, we certainly can hang around and ask, answer more questions. We're here to help as much as we can.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.